Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Cynthia Hawkins, gallery director and curator at the Bertha VB Letter Gallery. Thank you for joining us for our interview with photographer uh, Robert Doyle, whose work is on view in the gallery located at the State University of New York, Geneseo. COVID-19 has changed our daily and work lives, which also means rest restricted attendance to this and other museums and galleries. Hence, to broaden our audience, we have moved some exhibition programming online, which allows for lasting documentation of art programming at the college. As uh, with recent interviews, the PowerPoint of the work in the exhibition will loop while we talk. I became aware of Robert Doyle's work uh, while curating a photography exhibition, the landscape exterior interiors in the fall of 2019. <clears throat> Welcome, Robert. It's so good to have you here. Uh, would you let's start with uh, a little bit about your background and what compelled you to become an artist? I was in the Air Force. I was stationed in Europe, in Germany, and it was at that point in time uh, with with the, the military where they were moving towards an all volunteer force. So the pay there was a incredible pay raise. Pay essentially doubled in like 1971 or something for uh, low ranking and enlisted personnel. Uh, what that meant for me was having been assigned to a tour in Germany, I was able to live off the base in, uh, on the local economy in a little village at the bottom of the hill where my radio site was located. And they gave me a housing allowance in addition to cost of living uh, allowance for food, et cetera, et cetera, because I was living on the local economy. What that resulted in was a lot of money that I didn't really know what to do with. Let's put it that way. Uh, my expenses were met for, for the most part. And with all that extra money, I started buying camera equipment. And with the facilities on the airbase at Ramstein, uh, I was able to uh, basically teach myself photography. They had dark rooms. They had, uh, uh, you know, facilities for developing the film. There was uh, uh, the uh, personnel there that would help you sort of through the process. So in my three-year tour there, I would, you know, became relatively proficient in just the basics of, uh, you know, how, how how the apparatus worked and the the, the photochemical process, et cetera. And then, then coming back and going to art school, um, you know, that gave me an opportunity to sort of investigate a personal vision, I think. Um, and that's pretty much where it started. Um, during my time at the College of Art and Design, I started working at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts as a videographer. And my job there was to document uh, traveling exhibitions, uh, exhibitions that that originated with the museum, uh, the installation. Um, we, we did a number of programs with the conservation lab, so I spent a year uh, dealing, documenting the process of restoring a Japanese uh, silk scroll, painting on silk, you know, in the, on the scroll. And there were lots of other projects like that. So I got a pretty good background in, uh, you know, in, in art history, both as a as an undergraduate student and working in the museum and researching those uh, those projects. Um, and then, as far as photography goes, you know, that's just been a pro part of my daily routine since uh, you know the mid 1970s. I carry a camera with me wherever I go, and I photograph the things around me that um, either cause questions or um, potentially reveal answers. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, um, 
So you're saying that in, during the process of taking pictures all the time, that's how you, is that how you develop your themes? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a process of, of just recording, the, you know, it's like a, it's journal keeping as, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I, often I, I title the book projects that I'm working on as excerpts from my journals. As I accumulate those images, I go through them. Uh, that was one of the things that I learned, uh, you know, with you know the number a number of workshops that I took with photographers is that it's very important to review your work constantly, the the material that you're generating. It's it's really important to just look at that again and again and again, and not not put away in a drawer and assume that the project is finished. But there's all there are there's always something in the material that you're generating or have generated that is pointing towards the future, I think. Um, so my normal process, let's say, is to just photograph throughout my day. There are things that catch my eye. Sometimes uh, I repeat the, you know, go back to the same place, photograph the same thing uh, over and over again. And, uh, you know, then things start to sort of bubble to the surface. Let's say that, you know, uh, I, I was, there was there was a time, uh, you know, ten years ago or so, where I was working for the U.S. Census Bureau, which necessitated a lot of driving on this route through uh, Central New York, and I would pa pass the same locations every day. You know, it was like a 250 mile route that I had, and I started photographing these things, these places, and what occurred to me was that it was really a comment on the economy of rural America. There were closed businesses, there were houses that were, uh, you know, vacant and falling apart. Uh, you know, those kinds of things were consistent in this route that I was taking, which would take me through small villages and small cities and, and ended up in, in downtown Rochester every day. So that, that was an interesting observation, I think. and sort of from that researching those various areas, I started seeing um, uh, pollution sites. Uh, the, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation has a catalog of all uh, Superfund and Brownfield pollution sites in the state. And then I started going specifically to those places to photograph those sites and their current uh, situation, you know, the, the, the current uh, condition. And there were some interesting things that came up from that. Uh, that work was exhibited at uh, Monroe Community College a few years ago and uh, resulted in one of my book projects. Uh, I think the title was Vistas, which that, that term comes from uh, fo photo history or, or even prior to photography, you basically people would go on a, a vacation, a tour, tour the continent, you know, if you're, if you happen to be in Europe and they would collect vistas, you know, scenes, of, you know, these uh, idyllic landscapes, let's say. And what, what struck me about this particular situation was that as these sites were restored, most of the time what that entailed was covering it with six inches of sterile uh, dirt. You know, so it could be polluted six inches below the surface, but as long as there was six inches of clean soil on top, the site could be resurrected and used, you know, pretty much for anything. And uh, one, one uh, site, happened to, to have a pollution plume that went through the playground of a daycare, a church daycare center, wow. um, which I thought was a rather interesting situation, with, you know, to be, okay. <laughs> you know, non-judgmental non about it. <laughs> oh my God. So, I mean, that, I don't know if, if that clarifies anything or complicates it, but the, it, it's, but the photographic process for me is just one of living, let's say. And, and I learn things 
by looking at the pictures and then wondering what it is that's in the picture that I'm, you know, that I made, that I'm looking at, uh, and the implications of those things. You know, so it's 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 it's, it's all part of a process. There's never it's never really finished, I guess, if that makes sense. So, um, were you aware of these um, super fun sites before? Uh, well, I, I, I guess I assumed they existed, but I wasn't really, you know, it wasn't something that I had concerned myself with. Uh, the, the specific thing that, that triggered it for me was I was, I drove through uh, this small town and there was a vacant lot with these white pipes sticking up out of the ground, sort of random places. And I found that those are actually monitoring wells where they can drop sensors down and monitor the level of pollution in the ground at the site and, and then determine like whether it's you know, stable or dissipating. If it's dissipating, they tend to want to know where it's going. So then they'll put other monitoring wells on the periphery to see which direction the pollution is actually flowing through the ground. So that, that's what sparked the, the specific you know, investigation into the Superfund and, and Brownfield sites. Yeah. Like, what so, is what is this? You know. Yeah. So I looked at uh, a number of your your books, and I, um, you know, like I sort of think that sort of these vacant areas look always as an image look really interesting to me. Like when I drive by some village or town and wonder, you know, how it got to be that way, you know, um, where did everybody go, you know, <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, those are the kind of questions that come up to me when I look at those, those kind of images and the desk, you know, to be in what, I mean, we have an idea that the rural, rural areas are charming and pretty and attractive and when in fact there are so many that are quite the opposite right and um... yeah I mean and it's part of history the industrial revolution um, be before there was natural gas they made gas out of coal they would burn the coal and collect the fumes and then that was the gas that was piped into everybody's houses to light the lamps and mm -hmm. and such and there's an incredible amount of pollution at those former coal gas sites. Hmm. Um, there was one up on the canal uh, in uh, Albion, I think it was, another one down in Dansville. Um, and then the other, another thing that is pretty consistent that I found is uh, uh, dry cleaning operation. The chemicals used in dry cleaning are incredibly toxic. And it was very common practice, you know, back back in the day to just at the end of the shift, dump it out the back door and, you know, it goes, you know, either, you know, goes into the creek or the river or soaks into the ground. And as long as you don't see it, it's gone and nobody really thinks about it. Right. You know, after 70, 80, 90, 100 years of this, uh, you know, the, it doesn't just disappear. It's, you know, it's, it's in the ground. And a lot of those vacant lots are vacant because they can't build on them because they can't go past that six inch mark. So they can't yeah, so, dig down for a foundation. So your photographs are not only, you know, you know, they serve uh, several functions, you know, in the, you know, by being, they sort of document the areas you photograph, but, and they also have a, their own narrative that's you know separate from the sort of journalistic aspect of it to sort of like I would say sort of a rom romantic narrative right right of, like of longing and missing you know and <laughs> and then in photographs that you take where there are you know people engaging in social activities that's another um, aspect of it where there's, you know, engendering 
you know, relationships and uh, that is quite the opposite. I mean, like the opposite right. end of this, uh, you know, photographing these vacant towns and super fun sites. So, uh, but, and those sites used to be like, you know, used to enjoy yeah. family and friends and relationships. It's super, right. very interesting. Well, yeah, well, it, 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 it's, it's all part of that mix of just daily experiences, I think. And then going back through the material and pulling out specifics that sort of come together on their own. Um, so in some of the, the book projects, they're, they're actually pretty random because that's the, and you, I don't know if you noticed or not, but everything is chronological mm -hmm. in those books. Uh, so it's, I, I, I do that because I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to build, build a narrative out of bits and pieces. I'm trying to just show the, the narrative that, that exists naturally. And then, and, and because it's so random, you can then sort of filter out sections and put them someplace else. I can filter out those, 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 uh, you, know, you know, sort of, uh, the, the, the COVID mask things that, you know, that some of those are in the exhibition. Um, as I was just photographing over the last year, this, you know, everyone has got this thing over their face and it just struck me as being odd, sometimes humorous, uh, you know, depending upon the, the decoration of, of the mask, they went from very plain, you know, pieces of cloth or surgical masks, those blue masks to, Everyone, you know, you can buy them online. You know, you go to pin, Pinterest or whatever, and you can have a selection of of, of masks. Uh, 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 Nancy Pelosi has coordinated masks with her outfits daily. You know, um, I'm sure they're, you know, I, I, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I keep thinking. You know, I mean, not. Before last year, you would see somebody with a mask and you would be suspicious, right? And now, right. <laughs> most people, if you see someone without a mask, you're suspicious, you know, and you don't want to be near them any more than you would have previously under other circumstances. So, right. I, I totally. Yeah, it's, 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 it's been a, a rather interesting year, um, for sure. I mean, uh, just trying to figure out what is normal, I think. And uh, like the last two images in, in that series uh, that, I, that I had been working on this past year that uh, at the edge of the hurricane series, uh, one, is, one is of a, a, a sign in a store window that says we're closed. And the, and, the, and the next one is a sign in another store window, actually just two doors down, that says coming soon. You know, they're opening a new bakery. They're going to renovate the building and open a new bakery. And the one that closed was, was like a, an exercise uh, uh, kind of place, a, a gym salon mm -hmm. thing, you know, so which, which is sort of interesting because, you know, the one that closed was the one that that had a lot of daily activity, you know. The, that gym, they they had a they had a it, it was a combination of a gym and a, and a like a a, a, a a beauty salon. You know, there's lots of people coming and going constantly. And with COVID, they absolutely could not do that. Right. It was it was you know cold you know cold turkey dead clo you know closed up, and they couldn't they they couldn't last long enough to bring it back when things started to open up. The, uh, the other building, the coming soon, the bakery thing is, uh, that's of a local economic development project where, where uh, you know, there's a certain subsidy for creating new businesses and which, which there was a, a few examples of that kind of thing happening during COVID when everything had to close, the healthy businesses were using that time to regenerate and, you know, remodel and, you know, grow, you know, sort of grow their infrastructure uh, while they didn't have to deal with or, or couldn't deal with consumers. And then when it was time to reopen, they opened up much stronger and with which much more activity. Right. And, and that contradiction is something that I hope 
you can sort of get out of that pairing of images. Right. You know, so yeah, it's so it's like as much as many problems as it caused. Right. Were also, you know, uh, interesting new kinds of opportunities. You know. Right. Right. To um, interact with people. I mean, like Zoom is like off the rails, you know, <laughs> you know, and all the other methods. And so there's, it's really, you have, I guess we all have to be aware that, yeah, this is a terrible situation, but then how do we make the best of it, it opens up opportunities or right, yeah. possibilities rather, you know. Right. So yeah, it's yeah, every, it all it all goes on, you know, it, it continues, you know, it's it's different. There is there is no normal. There is just yeah. what is, I guess. You know. <laughs> yeah, normal <laughs> changes all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I wanted to ask about the the um I guess what's not clear in the PowerPoint is the large scale photographs. Uh, portraits, which we can um, take a look at. Um, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that either. I meant this before we get to that. Um, it's like Skyler and boys, they're eight, uh, nine feet, eight feet by nine feet. This is, you know, it's in this way present in this presentation you can't tell that but um, right. so these portraits can you talk about these portraits and who these people are why you did this and um did it photograph them in this way okay um I think from pretty pretty early on when I was in undergraduate school I, I started thinking about the scale the scale of the of the thing that was represented in the image, um, and how that re related to reality, you know, the world we sort of live in. Um, you know, a large photograph is you know like sixteen by twenty inches, uh, but if you look at, at you know that size relative to painting, that's a very that's a small easel painting. You know, so it is it, there's a rel relative definition there, I guess. Um, I, I had set up a, a, a system when I was in school to, at a certain distance with a certain lens, uh, and it, I could make an image that when printed to that size, to 16 by 20 inches, let's say, uh, the object rendered in the photograph was life-size. It was a one-to-one -one representation. And uh, that that was sort of interesting to me because there was a lot of discussion then about the you know the relationship between the image and object you know you know what is it we're looking at what is it is it an image or is it an object that kind of you know it's one of those fun things that art students talk about I guess <laughs> anyway uh, so but but that that thought has has stuck with me uh, you know from from the beginning um, and this project obviously relates to that to some extent because the figures are pretty close to life size. Uh, I had, I had in my head, I had sort of set it up so that at that distance with that particular lens, um, you know, it was, it was going to, it was going to render like that. So, you know, that, that was pretty determined. Yes. Uh, the, the scale also sort of comes from, uh, uh, but when I, when I was in the service and, and in Europe, I made a number of trips to France, to Paris, to the to the Louvre, and and other museums. And one of the the series of uh, works that really impressed me was the Rubens uh, de Medici cycle, the large paintings of I, I forget it was a Marie or Catherine. I'm, I'm not I don't remember anymore. But basically, her life in this gallery and these paintings are like 15 feet high or something. It's just you know monumental and that it, that image has always stuck with me my initial vision for this exhibition was to have like 10 of these portraits 
sort of surrounding, you know, on the periphery of the gallery, you know, just, you know, just, you're like in the middle of this thing with all these big pictures. Um, so that, that sort of was feeding into it. Uh, Richard Avedon did a, a, a picture of the Chicago seven that were he, with his eight by 10 view camera. And then those were printed to eight by 10 feet. And I saw those at e either MoMA or the Met years ago. I don't remember which. But again, you're, you're interacting with these life-sized figures on the wall, you know, as a photograph. So those are the sort of things that we're feeding into wanting to do this. The fragmented, you know, the, these are made up of 12 separate exposures. And so that fragmentation, um, another thing that I sort of think about is, is what we see and what we, what, we, what we remember. So if you look at these portraits, and then you walk away from them, you don't see the fragments, you see the whole. You know, you see these, these images of these people doing whatever they happen to be doing and you sort of ignore the misalignment of the, the verticals and horizontals, et cetera. So you're reconstructing it in a way that's different than its reality. Right. You know, so that contradiction I, I think is sort of interesting. Yeah, it's almost um, like you're looking through a window, you know, you're just like, you're... Yeah, the black frames, the black frames definitely do that. I, I, I purposefully didn't want to try to make it seamless. I mean, I could easily have done that with, you know, with, with a little more uh, labor, um, but I, I didn't find those things interesting you know there's the your, your cell phone will do that all you have to do is like you know do the panorama mode and it'll stitch all these things together and it becomes seamless um, and i'm not a, at all interested in trying to mimic that right. or or to uh, well then you lose any, the anyway yeah if you excuse me seamless you sort of lose this sort of uh the craft of it you know it's like it becomes it's more mechanical when it's uh, seamless. Well, it, it's sort of a lie. I mean, that's really what it comes down to for me. <laughs> you know, it's it's not that. It's uh, um, I, in, in in the landscape show. I had like a cup. There were a couple three panel panoramas that are pretty much the same uh, method of you know shooting three images and then putting them together. And, and in those images, I was sort of thinking of them in terms of cinema as, as a pan where the camera is panning across the scene. Mm -hmm. in, in these portraits, it's, I don't think of them in terms of cinema as much as like a, a, almost cubist. I mean, if you, if you want to put it in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, Cezanne and, and, and early Picasso, this sort of fragmentation, this right. fragmented view of, of a scene and then when you walk away, like I said, you, your mind reconstructs that into a whole unified scene. And, and that's, that's, that was a thing that I'm, you know, was definitely interested in and playing with. Um, people themselves are all uh, friends uh, that I have, uh, you know, that I've known for quite a, quite a while, all of them, I think. Um, there are others in the series of, of people that I don't know that well, but uh, have, uh, you know, had some level of professional interaction with. But they're, they're, in, they're in an environment that they have either created themselves or are part of intimately because that's where they're working. Or uh, in the case of one, one guy, it was, it was an exhibition of his photographs that I had put together. And he, so he's standing in the gallery surrounded by, you know, 50 images of, of his own work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, so, so there's a relationship between the subject and the environment. Uh, the latter two from this series, the one of Nicole that you have up right now, and then uh, Jackie, those were like post COVID after the lockdown. And they, they are both behind glass. They're in windows, storefront windows. Um, and, and what I found interesting about that is, is the combination of the scene, the, the setting that they're in, and then the reflected 
seen in the glass. And that sort of combination of, uh, you know, the reflection and the, and the, and the reality, I guess, I don't know. Yeah, so you um, have, I mean, the portrait itself is like, you know, actual in this environment with the reflections on the glass is sort of an illusion, you know, um, uh, excuse me. It's uh, sort of in parts of sort of, you know, mysticism or you know, eerie. Yeah, it's it's the yeah. There there's a there. You know, it's the screen between between the photographer or the viewer and the subject, for sure. It's uh, and then you have the the additional images like the, in Nicole, you can see the building across the street, you can see the, the clouds. And then if you're sort of looking through that, you can see the furniture and stuff. She, she manages this furniture store, uh, you know, so so you can see all of the things in the in the store itself, but they're almost uh, almost obscured or they are obscured in certain in certain places. And then the architectural elements of the the window frames. Um, th there's just a lot of ambiguity there that that is pretty interesting. I think it's interesting on a sort of a formal uh, painterly level. Let's. I, I think that's probably the the easiest uh, way to describe it. It, it it's yeah. You know, it's not photographic. It's more it's something else. Something else. Well, what also it's not just them being in their environment where they live or work, but it also extends to the community because you see across the street, you see the clouds, you see. So the um, that whole idea of environment is expanded. In right. Yeah. The, uh, can, can you put the one of Jackie up? Yes. Let's see. That. Uh, yeah. 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 Now th this this was like another sort of uh, step away. Uh, th this this person is is very short. She's like under five feet tall. Um, and I I changed lenses, uh, you know, because I, I wanted uh, I wanted basically I just wanted to see what it was going to do uh, to to get in closer and to to make a larger, uh, a larger enlargement, let's say, of, of the, of the figure, and you know, so so this four foot nine inch woman suddenly becomes almost eight feet tall, yeah, which, yeah. In, in a lot of ways, really fits her personality because she she's very monumental. <laughs> yeah, I, I, know. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and again, the the combination of the reflection and looking through the glass, uh, uh, I, I I think I think is is a pretty it's another it's a very interesting image for me. Um, sure, sure, it does. She looks. I didn't recognize her at first because she seemed so tall, you know. Because <laughs> I yeah. So it really changes the way you re react to her, respond to the photograph, because if you do have encountered her, but you, as you say, she has enormous energy and, and will and uh, runs this incredible, you know, the um, Livingston County, no, Wyoming County Arts. What, County. Wyoming, yeah. Yeah, and does yeah. an amazing job of it too. So, yeah. No, this is a beautiful photograph. And also, it does similarly, you know, you see the cars and the buildings and the sky. And so it's like quite, you know, this person in an expansive um, environment, you know. It's really, really great idea there. Great way uh, makes. Um, does a lot of different things, these photographs. It's just uh, exceptional. Thank you. So let us get to your artist statement because I <laughs> you're right. how much I like, I love it, right? So I'm just gonna take us over to, because I, I put, I had to break it into three to fit in a okay. slide and be, still be uh, legible. So one of the things I like about it is 
the way you um, uh, approach the idea of the portrait, how you break up, break down the language of that represents portraiture, the language of the portrait, the definition. Mm -hmm. And to me, that seemed, to me, that's really significant. And it also has this effect of poetry, you know? So, but I have to say, I did in the Hurricanes at the Edge, I see a very different a met methodology of talking about your photographs than years before. Like you did not do this in previous uh, <clears throat> books. So can you tell me about your new, I'll say to me, new way of rendering text in relation to the photograph? Um, are, are you are you talking about the 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 text journal entries in in yes. that series? Of yes. Okay. Um, okay. There's no direct correlation between the text and the images. They're right. totally separate threads, um, but they're concurrent. I mean, they're, they're happen they're happening in the same time frame. You can see that from the from the date and time of the photographs and the date and time of the journal entries. Uh, you know, so they're, they're sort of happening together. And it was with, with, with that uh, series of books, I was really trying to, I don't know if I, what I was, I don't think I was really trying to do anything. It was just like the way, the way that I was sort of dealing with that was collecting the things that I was doing on a regular basis through this, uh, the situation that we were all in, this pandemic, you know, it's like the world, the world seemed to be going along normally. And then all of a sudden, you know, two months, three months into it, it just shuts down. So, you know, I took the, you know, my, my daily journal entries, which are infrequent and occasional. Um, I, I, for a long time, I was doing those little, those drawings, um, in the morning, just just as a way to sort of focus on the day and begin my day, you know, clearing, just you know, to do them, I, I sort of had to like get rid of everything else in my head and just make that drawing. And they were, it never took more than like 35, 40 seconds to, to do one of those. But the process of, I think, you know, thinking about it, getting ready to do it, doing it, and then turning the page and going on to something else was sort of a, a, an exclamation mark for beginning my day. So that's where the drawings come in. The, the text entries are at random times, often late at night uh, when I'm trying to figure out what the hell happened today. <laughs> um, and then the photographs are, you know, just constant things going on. So to put those three things together in some sort of continuum was, uh, you know, my, my point of departure. And it was, it was sort of, uh, it wasn't, I didn't, I didn't plan to do this. Uh, what I, I, th I think I referenced in, in the, the first block of text in, in the first book, that it was really just, it, I started this as like an experiment with, with uh, a camera and a lens combination and, you know, trying to go back to black and white, um, because I had, I had normally my, my uh, analog photography has all been, for the most part, black and white triax, you know, process in the darkroom, and I was trying to mimic that to a certain extent with a digital camera. So that's how that's how this began, and then the pandemic sort of like, you know, hit. And what I found was that this camera combination was. It, very, very similar physically to the setup that I would use in the early 70s, you know, a small Leica with a wide angle lens and, uh, you know, you know, so, so it became a very comfortable thing 
and small enough to carry with me constantly. I didn't need a bag with another lens or a flash or something in it. Everything was contained right on the camera. Um, so it became this sort of, you know, like your, your little notebook that, or sketchbook that you would carry with you wherever you go. It's, it was that, that equivalent in, in photography. Um, am I getting off track, I think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, the, so the relationship between the text and the images is not direct, but it is, it, it, it is, it is in a way because it's all together. It's all happening together. And it's, it's a way for me to try to make sense of this chaotic year, I guess. Um, well, I, I just also think that the way the text is on the page, the spacing and mm -hmm. all that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, and has and behaves, yeah, as you said, a separate entity related, but independent at the same time from. Right, uh, right. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know, write, writing is something that I'm trying to do more of. Um, most of what I'm reading is, is, uh, is poetry as opposed to prose. Um, or very poetic prose or something. Um, so, so I mean that, and that's feeding into what it is I write and how I write. I think um, I'm, you know, I've in the past couple of years I've read a lot of Bukowski and uh, Hunter Thompson, and you know, it's like the crazy people, those crazy guys, you know, um, which it, it's. They're, I find them really interesting. I, when, when I was in college, I drove taxi, you know, in Minneapolis. And at the end of the shift, I would meet my mom and dad at this little bar because they both worked in places close to the little bar. So all of those guys sitting up and down that bar at between, you know, 4.30 and 8.30 every night could easily have been Bukowski. <laughs> It's like I knew I knew him as soon as I picked up his books. I said, I know this guy. <laughs> well, so. I, I just find, you know, the way your your definitions and working out the idea and what those concerns are about portraiture and rendering and which also relates to your personal self portraits in the uh um, edge of the hurricane, which I find the combination of the drawing and the text and the photograph to be really, um, really quite wonderful. And uh, as different as they all are, and they each make res one response to each on its own and as a whole. So it's a uh, uh, I think an uh, interesting way to that bringing in the the process of preparing to mm -hmm. is is important because you know that gets lost to uh, for everyone else you know like for you it's there it's personal you do it but in the in your the final result of the work it's not present so people. <laughs> Like most right. artists like jump out of, you know, jump yeah. out of bed and run in the studio, but it's right. not. Like that. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a constant process and it's constantly referencing, you know, like, like I said er, early on, it's like, you know, one, one of the things I, I, I learned from you know, from other photographers that I've uh, studied with is it's, is the importance of going back and looking at what you did previously, because that's going to, that's going to foreshadow, uh, foretell what you're going to do in the future, you know, in, in a lot of cases. And in some cases, uh, you know, I mean, you, you can see those threads. If you, if you look at, uh, you know, it, it, it's just, it's just part of the process, I guess. And in, in this, this artist statement uh, thing that I, I, I gave you, it was, um, I, like, I like to know, 
I mean, you know, the, the, the history of the word and what it, what it meant and what it means, you know, there's like hidden meanings in what it used to mean. Right. You know, it's like the implications uh, of, of what it is we're talking about is in the, you know, the history of the words that we use. And um, I think it's important to sort of build a foundation that, that you can, you know, move, move, move away from or come from or, or whatever you have to, it has to be grounded in something. And to look at, you know, the relationships of, you know, uh, English and French and German and Italian and, and you know, et cetera, and, and how those roots, the roots of those words inter interacted and interact still um, define how we think about what it is we're doing. Right. Whether we know it or not, I guess. Right. So. Well, and we, you know, we lose connection to the, the words. Language is also. Right always right. changing right and evolving and so we lose we lose connection to the source you know right. so, and it is you know especially when you have a specific project or goal in mind and you want to really get your get a handle on what does this mean you know mm -hmm. and i i agree that's a excellent way of you know building that foundation yes because yeah, it, it, it's i think it, it for me it sort of like slows me down and makes me consider yeah I think, I think those are two two things that are pretty important is to slow down and consider what you're doing and consider the the implication and the the genesis of the idea somehow you know like how how you know where, where is this coming from and where is it going so so do you, um, um, one, do, you know, do you still have other photographers or artists that you feel influence your thinking about your work or have you moved beyond that? It sounds like um, it's more filling that role now. It's, uh, uh, my bookshelf is, you know, got a lot of books up there and I keep buying them. So there must be some reason <laughs> for that. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I don't think I would say that at this point in time, I am, I am uh, functioning as a student of any, anybody, I don't think. I don't know if that sounds egotistical or not, but I, I, think, I think at a point you become comfortable with what you do and uh, I, and also, I think it's important to acknowledge that whatever I do or anybody else does is really not that unique or new. It's a, it might be a combination of things that we haven't seen that much of in the past, but everything is, I, I firmly believe that everything's been done and it's just a way of, you know, we got to, I have to entertain myself on a daily basis. <laughs> So yeah, I, I, I could I could pick up any any of my photographs and I could probably reference, you know, eight to 10 photographers that yeah. it reminds me of, you know, I mean, that's, that that's my reality. Yeah. Uh, well, and I, I have no problem admitting that. <laughs> I mean, we all, uh, there is so many people out there. It's been many, many hundreds of years, you know, and like we look and we look and yeah, the real trick is finding your own way to say, yeah. same, you know, this is all we have is what we have, right? Yeah, and and it's not just photography that that I would uh, identify as a source either. I mean, having spent you know that that time in the museum and uh, you know and, and studying art history. Uh, there's so there's so many bits and pieces that feed into it. Um, like you know, I, I I mentioned Rubens, um, and you, you, I don't think you can even like talk about portraiture and not not reference uh, 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 Rembrandt. You know, I mean that's how how can you how can you not? You know, you turn a light on and suddenly it's it's Rembrandt. You know. Um, 
and then the landscape stuff is, is you know the the I think I think there my my real uh, the things that I, I have been interested in since high school really have been the the uh, the fr the French landscape painters from you know be before the Impressionists you know uh, yeah. Corot and Corbet and uh, you know Pizarro and you know and those guys uh, that were like breaking breaking out of the academy contradicting the academy and uh, sort of forging a new path you know I mean th those were the those are the people that I think are were interesting uh, so there you go <laughs> well, I want to I want to thank you for Robert for sharing your work with us in Geneseo community, spending time with us. What a great conversation! And um, I um, hope everyone gets to see. We'll go to the gallery's webpage at. Um, geneseo.edu slash um, letterer dash online dash digital dash exhibitions and find uh, Robert's work and on Flickr and this interview on YouTube. Thank you very much again. It's good Thank to you. See you. Thank you very much. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Did it record? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't, I'm not telling you. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was I realized I was so intent on having it ready for four o'clock yesterday that I completely I didn't see the I looked at Wednesday and I didn't see the Zoom link and I thought, oh my God, I didn't do it. And, and yeah, I remember when you said, you told me you had a meeting and I was like, Cynthia, just because I wanted it. I wanted it that badly. <laughs> I've got everything else. Well, as my husband would say, that's, that's you, that's me. <laughs> All right. Well, um, you have a, what is this Thursday? Have a nice weekend. Yeah, I think so. I'll, I'll contact you next week. Your sound went away. I, okay. Can you can you see me now? Yeah, I can see you. I didn't hear you. Okay. I, I said I'll contact you next week about coming in and documenting the exhibit. Okay. All right. So I was told that so when you I'm gonna fill out the form for you, but I'm also okay. gonna give you five bucks because if I pay you, you're a vendor. And <laughs> You love it, right? You love that. Right? Uh, all right, cool. Whatever, <laughs> whatever. Does this have to? Does the check come from Albany? <laughs> no, it's gonna be cash. <laughs> all right. God, right. Whatever, whatever works will be fine. Right. Okay. Let's all right. You have a good weekend too, Cynthia. Thank you very right. much. Okay. Bye.